Hi, everybody. Grab a Bible, open it up to Psalm 14. Psalm 14. As you're turning there, let me uh, make one quick announcement. You know, this last June, a team of us from here went to Ghana, West Africa, on a missions trip. And we began some work there. And on Thursday of this week, Chris Wing and I are going back to Ghana for 10 days where we will continue the work that we started. Uh, Chris will spend some time with business leaders and financial leaders and church financial teams, and he will do some business and finance training for them. I will put on a three-day pastor's conference. You know, the pastors there don't have theological training. They don't get to do retreats or anything like that, uh, but we, we're going to put that on for them. And with that comes some expense, and so many of you have, have said, anytime there's a missions expense, would you please let us know about that? So we're just going to let everybody know about that, uh, because we, we will pay for their housing and their travel and their food and a gift for them and all the stuff that goes with that. The, the total cost for us to do all of this is about $7,000. So if there are any of you that would feel so inclined to help offset some of those missions costs, all you have to do is write missions on the memo line of your check or designate it online to go towards that. And those dollars will go directly to our time in Ghana over this next week. Pray for us, if you would, as we spend a lot of time on airplanes and uh, it's very hot in Africa right now. Um, in fact, they told us that the air right now looks like it has glitter in it because the wind is blowing in from the north and it's the Sahara sands that are in the air. So I hope it snows here <laughs> while I am in Africa. In Genesis chapter six, we find ourselves only nine generations after Adam and Eve. The world is up and running the population has dramatically increased and has spread all over the ancient Near East. And as if proving the doctrine of total depravity, as mankind spread, so did their wickedness. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, Then Yahweh saw that the evil of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God is ready to wipe humanity off the face of the earth with a global flood, but God grants grace to one man and decides to start over with him. And after introducing us to Noah, the Bible records again God's assessment of the world, Genesis 6, verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Now, there are two images that come out in Genesis 6 that were already repeated and will be repeated again further on in Genesis. God sees... And the world is corrupt. In Genesis 11, at the Tower of Babel, humanity decides to build a tower to the heavens as a monument to their own greatness. God sees their corruption and scatters them across the world. Those same twin themes come up again in Genesis 18 regarding the famous cities of Sodom and Gomorrah as God sees their wickedness and destroys them for it. Those images of God coming down to see and that the world is corrupt and sinful, those are the dominating themes of Psalm 14. So let's read it. The wicked fool says in his heart, there is no God. They act corruptly. They commit abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Yahweh looks down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who has insight, anyone who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. Altogether, they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of iniquity not know 
who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon Yahweh? There they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but Yahweh is his refuge. Oh, that salvation, oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When Yahweh restores his captive people, may Jacob rejoice, may Israel be glad. The field of Bible interpretation is called hermeneutics. And there are numerous guiding principles and laws that help us to rightly understand and interpret the Bible. The most common rule and law that's most helpful when it comes to the regular reading of the Bible is this. What is repeated is important. You've heard me say that dozens of times before. What is repeated is important. If one of the biblical authors uses repetition, they're trying to tell you something. It's showing their agenda for what they're writing. For example, Philippians is known as the epistle of joy because the apostle Paul will use the words for joy and rejoice so many times. The book of Hebrews has the continued repetition of the word better. In Jesus, we have a better priest, a better covenant, a better sacrifice, and on and on it goes. In these Genesis passages we already read, We've already seen the repetition of corruption and God seeing it. And then comes Psalm 14. Not only does it repeat those same themes, but Psalm 14 is rare in that it is the only psalm that is repeated again in the Psalms. And it's repeated not only in the Psalms, but later on in the New Testament book of Romans. So Psalm 14 is repeated almost verbatim in Psalm 53. There are some minor differences, and we'll look at that when we get to Psalm 53 in like 15 years. <laughs> but the primary idea behind Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 is repeated again when the Apostle Paul takes up their words in Romans 3, and we're going to look at that text in a minute. What is repeated is important. When God says something once, it's worthy of our prompt attention. When God says something twice, we stop and dwell there. When he repeats something for a third time, we dive deeply because apparently God wants to hammer that message home to us. Psalm 14 is what's known as a wisdom psalm. It helps us to ponder the way of the wicked and the way of the righteous, revealing to us the foolishness of living apart from God and apart from his ways. So let's walk through it together. We begin, number one, with an assessment of humanity. David will look at all of humanity, and not only will he offer an assessment, God will offer an assessment. And there's some characteristics of humanity that he gives. First, insanity. Insanity. Go to verse one. The wicked fool says in his heart, there is no God. They act corruptly. They commit abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The wicked fool, in the original language, has no definite article. The the is not there. So this isn't referring to a single person, but to everyone in the category of fool. You'll notice all the verbs associated with fool are plural. They act, they commit. So the, the wicked fool is widespread. A fool, biblically, is not someone who is mentally deficient. A fool in the Bible is someone who is morally perverse. It's a synonym for sinner. In fact, the fool might very well be highly educated and very intelligent, but they are morally flawed. In fact, the word for fool can literally translate as aggressive perversity. The fool says in his 
heart. Notice they don't say this in their mind or with their intellect. So we're not talking about someone who is what we would call a theoretical atheist, a a person who has looked intently at the evidence and concluded from the clear evidence that God does not exist. That's not what we're talking about. They say in their heart, not referring to their emotions, but the seat of their will. They say there is no God because they don't want there to be a God. And why are they considered a fool? Because the evidence is clear that God is real. And they choose to reject that. Their entire existence has always been one of complete rejection of God. Listen to Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. God's revelation in creation is clear enough evidence to show not only God's power, but to show his divine nature. Creatures can look at creation and plainly determine that we owe worship and honor to the one who created us. Any other conclusion is a rejection of obvious revelation. That's what Romans 1 clearly says. That's why they are without excuse. No one gets to claim ignorance before God. So why is it that they reject? Is it because that the evidence is so clear, pointing to random chance that created and rules the universe? No, they reject because they suppress the truth by their wickedness. And their suppression of truth leads to depravity. That's what Psalm 14 says. They act corruptly. It's a callback to Genesis 6, where when Moses writes the book of Genesis, he uses that word three times to describe the world before the flood. It's corrupt. Now, corrupt is a technical military term. It means to ruin or to spoil. After a a military campaign will come in and destroy a city or a people group, it's referred to by this word, it's ruined. That city is destroyed. It's also used in a spiritual sense. It's used to describe the corruption of Israel when they worship the golden calf in Exodus 32. They've been ruined. And because humanity is corrupt, they commit, notice Psalm 14, abominable deeds. That's, those aren't only committed by the famous snowman by that name. Abominable means that their actions are morally repulsive to God. Their deeds are incompatible with God. They are repulsive to him. That's why when the Bible will label things with this word abominable, it's typically attached to words like hate and reject and abhor. God hates these things. He abhors these things. He rejects these things because they are incompatible with him. So these wicked fools are separate from him. They've always been separate from him. And that's why nothing they can do could be labeled as good. No one does good. Their deeds are not for God's glory and honor, no matter what morally good things that that they might do that we would say are good because our society for the time being says they are morally good. There is no one who does good. So David now expands the search and moves beyond just the, the wicked fool, as if that's some category, to saying, All of humanity is in this category. 
No one does good. P.C. Craigie wrote it this way, the fool is not a rare subspecies within the human race. All human beings are fools apart from the wisdom of God. So that's the first assessment of humanity, insanity. Secondly, immorality. One leads directly to the other. Go to verse two. Yahweh looks down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who has insight, anyone who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. Altogether, they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So notice the universal language. Anyone, all, altogether, no one, not even one. Now, it might be easy to think David's just being pessimistic. He's had a bad day, bad month, maybe lost a battle recently. I mean, is it really true that everyone is this way? Notice this is not David's conclusion. This is God's conclusion. God looks down, and based on his divine search, this is his conclusion. The Lord looks down from heaven. Again, it's language borrowed from the book of Genesis. God sees the corruption of the flood. He comes down to, to Babel. He sees Sodom and Gomorrah and their wickedness. And again, notice the clear language. Where is God looking from? From heaven. He looks down. It literally translates, he bows to see. Why? Because God is above. He is exalted. He alone sits in the place of judgment. He alone has this vantage point to make such a declaration. And from his exalted place of scrutiny, he sees all and he knows all. He looks down, quote, on the sons of men, referring to all of humanity. And that phrase, sons of men, literally translates as sons of Adam. Because one of the Hebrew words for man is Adam, which is interesting that God would name Adam, Adam. It's very creative. Hey, that's a man. We'll call him man, Adam. So th this is not only a reference, sons of Adam. It's not just a reference to being a human being. It's a not so subtle reminder that we are children of Adam our first parent in the Garden of Eden, the one who brought sin to the human race. We're all sons of Adam. So when God looks down from heaven, what is he looking for? He's looking for two kinds of people, David says. He's looking for anyone who has insight, meaning he's looking for someone who's wise, the antithesis of the fool. Where is the one who does not reject me? Where is the one who welcomes me? He's looking for anyone who has insight. He's looking for anyone who seeks God. The word means investigate, inquire. So where is the one who sees the clear evidence of my existence and sets about to find me? Where is the one who would worship me? And what is the conclusion of his search? Verse three, they have all turned aside. When God looks at the human race, looking for anyone with insight or anyone seeking after him, he finds no one, not one. Together, he says, they have become worthless. That word is used elsewhere in the Bible to refer to sour milk. It's not a flattering image of humanity. And then he restates the end of verse three, the thesis of the psalm, there is no one who does good, not even one. No one is looking for God. No one is searching him out. No one is moral enough or kind enough up to God's standard. No one has the insight to know him. Mankind is universally condemned. And apart from the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, no one understands. 
No one seeks. No one is good. Thirdly, ignorance. As we continue to assess humanity, the third characteristic is ignorance. Verse 4. Do all the workers of iniquity not know who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon Yahweh? Because humanity has not sought after God and they've suppressed the truth by their wickedness, this is God's conclusion. They have no knowledge. They do not know. They're ignorant as a whole of God and of his ways. So left to themselves, they do what's evil. And specifically, there's two things that they do. First, they devour God's people. They eat up God's people like bread. And eating bread is a regular daily occurrence. That's what's being referenced here. So the evil commonly, daily, hate God's people. Eat them like bread. The language of eating implies violence. They devour God's people and they do not call upon the Lord. Now that, that phrase is used in a couple of ways in the Bible. They do not call upon the Lord. Calling upon the Lord is used throughout Scripture to first refer to someone who is crying out to be saved. And it refers secondly to the organized worship of God when his people gather together. We cry out to the Lord in worship. So the wicked are condemned for two ignorant actions. They do not worship God and they do not love God's people. Which is why you continue to hear me say one of the biggest evidences of genuine salvation is you will find them in church. Where are true Christians to be found? Only one place, in the church. Because there, we call upon God in worship and we love God's people. And if you don't do those things, you are not his. One more thing to note before we move on. In verses one through three, only the wicked are referred to. The only people group mentioned and it's universal. But now in verse four, and in every single verse in the rest of the psalm, there's a second group of people who are referred to, God's people. They're titled my people in verse four. They're titled the righteous generation in verse five. They're titled afflicted in verse six. They're titled his people in verse seven. Verses one, two, and three are some of the strongest verses in the Bible regarding the depravity of mankind. Yet, the righteous exist. Where did they come from? So as David, as God looks at all of humanity and universally says, they're all condemned, they're all worthless, this is for everyone, is there then some separate group that's immune from all of that, that's unique, that has existed outside of that condemnation, a, a group that's more intelligent, a group that's more spiritual, a group that's more open to God, that they're the ones who have always loved God, they figured out they're moral, they're kind, they, they know God, and, and they join in that condemnation of the world. No, that group doesn't exist. Never did. So where do the righteous come from? They come out of the group known as the wicked. That's where they come from. Because the condemnation is universal in verses one, two, and three. Everyone is wicked, not even one. Yet, as God looks at that wicked, depraved, ignorant, rejecting group of people called humanity, God, in his mercy, chooses people out of that condemned group. And he enlightens them. And he gives them knowledge and wisdom and makes them his own. That 
is the only way that anyone from that condemned group could ever come out of it and be righteous. They weren't already righteous. God made them righteous. God gives them a new heart, promised in the Old Testament prophets, revealed now in Christ, we have been given a new heart, a heart that doesn't reject God, a heart that sees that God is real, a heart that would seek after him, a heart that would love him, a heart that would worship him. Fourth description of humanity is intimidation. Verse five, there they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but Yahweh is his refuge. So those verses look ahead to the judgment that would await us all. He begins with the judgment of the wicked. There they are in great dread. That's the fate of the wicked. They've bullied. They've seemingly gotten away with all they've done, but the day is coming when they will stand in great dread because God is with the righteous generation. He is not with the wicked. He stands opposed to them. And verse six simply repeats the same idea in parallel poetic form. David will shift to the second person and he will address the wicked directly. You would shame God's people. Shame is a word used to refer to what happens in a military victory. The vanquished are shamed in their defeat. But that doesn't happen because God is the refuge of the righteous. He protects them. He secures them. Therefore, the wicked cannot and will not defeat them. So that's the assessment of humanity. And it's dark. Number two, the appeal to heaven. Verse seven. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When Yahweh restores his captive people, may Jacob rejoice, may Israel be glad. David pours out his heart and his soul here, expressing this desire for salvation, for the rescue of God's righteous people from the clutches of the wicked. And what that looks like is God restoring his people out of their captivity. Well, that will happen in history pretty soon after David wrote those very words. From Babylon, God would deliver his people out of their captivity and restore them to their position as his people. He'd already done it with the Exodus. He will do it again with the captivity. But ultimately... That will happen in Jesus Christ alone. Listen to Romans 3 as the Apostle Paul pulls out of his Old Testament, Psalm 14, and says, let's talk about this now for those of us who live after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Verse 10 of Romans 3, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. In the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's the New Testament assessment of humanity, and it is exactly the same as the Old Testament assessment of humanity. Nothing has changed. And again, Paul applies this now to the universal condemnation of all humanity in sin. We are in our own captivity. We're not in Egypt. We're not in Babylon. We're in sin. 
that Jesus said anyone who sins is a slave to sin. We're hopeless. Which is not surprising, considering the language the Bible uses to describe our condition outside of Christ. We are wicked fools with corrupt hearts that reject God, who are corrupt and live in a way that is morally repulsive to God and incompatible with him. And when God looks upon us, he sees no one with insight and understanding. No one who's interested in God. No one who seeks for him. All have turned aside, away from him, and and have become worthless like sour milk. No one does good, not even one. Meaning, you are not the exception to that. So we cry out like David, oh, that salvation would come out of Zion. We need saving. We can't do any of this on our own. Read the description. We're powerless. And David's prayer was absolutely answered. From King David's own family line, In Zion, the very city of Jerusalem, salvation has indeed come. The Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua, which in translated into Greek is Jesus. David's prayer was answered for us because salvation is, incarnate has come and there saved his people. He has set us free from the penalty and the power of sin. He opened our eyes to the truth of who he is and gave you a new heart that loves him, that seeks him and worships him. And he has transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. Salvation has come out of Zion. So we, verse seven, rejoice. We are glad. Because as heavy and hard as it is to embrace, this is the Bible's description of me. God initiated God stepped in and did for you what you could not do for yourself. As an act of love, by his mercy, he took out a wicked, foolish heart that says there is no God and gave you a heart that would seek him and love him and worship him. Oh, what grace. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that you you do this. You've done this. Because we can't do this for ourselves. And as contemporary people who live the lives that we live, it's hard to believe that. Because we like being told we can do anything we want. We like hearing about ourselves. We have limitless potential. And we have breathed in the lies of our culture about us, that humanity is wonderful and kind and good and moral and spiritual. But those lies directly contradict the truth of the Bible because none of those things are actually true about humanity. Instead, we see the truth that we're wicked and corrupt and we don't have any insight and we don't seek you. We've turned aside to go our own way. 
but you. You stepped in and you turned us. And you took out a wicked, sinful, rejecting heart and gave us a righteous one. And you set us on a better path. You, you picked us up out of a kingdom of darkness where we would simply stumble around for all of eternity and you placed us into the kingdom of your son. And now our eyes are open. Our hearts are alive to you. Thank you for your gracious, initiating, saving work. So as we do every week, we take a piece of bread and a cup of juice and we remember the sacrificial, substituting work of Jesus as he stood in our place and took upon death that our sin deserved so that we could be set free, so that we could have a new heart, so that we could be adopted as sons and daughters into your family. Thank you for the work of Jesus for sinners like us. We remember him now. In his name we pray. Amen.